Welcome all to the Institute for Human Ecology. Today's event is a discussion on A Vision of Hope, Catholic Schooling in Massachusetts, a book published by the Pioneer Institute. The Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America exists to educate students in the Catholic tradition, to sponsor academic research on the intersection of human flourishing and Catholic social doctrine, and to influence discussion in the public square. The Institute seeks to carry out Pope Leo XIII's charge to the university to give the Republic her best citizens. We are pleased to co-sponsor today's event with the Pioneer Institute. Pioneer is a Boston public policy research center that values an America where the citizenry is well-educated, willing to test its beliefs, beliefs based on facts and the free exchange of ideas and committed to liberty, personal responsibility and free enterprise. Pioneer's mission is to develop and communicate ideas that advance prosperity and a vibrant civic life in Massachusetts and beyond. A vision of hope certainly fits that mission, offering remarkable insight into education that is relative to Massachusetts as well as all of America. We'll open today's events with George Weigel, whose fascinating foreword to A Vision of Hope reflects on Pope St. John Paul II's educational experience and his teaching on education. Then Kara Candle will discuss the findings of A Vision of Hope. Kendra Espinoza will discuss the significance of the Supreme Court's Espinoza decision. And Patrick Wolf will give a summary of the book and the importance of parental power over their children's education. We'll conclude the event with a Q&A. And in that regard, please submit your questions through the Q&A button on your screen. <clears throat> Our first speaker, George Weigel, is a theologian and one of America's leading public intellectuals. He is distinguished senior fellow in William E. Simon Chair in Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Weigel is the author of the international best-selling two-volume biography of Pope St. John Paul II, Witness, Wit Witness to Hope, and The End and the Beginning. He is the author or editor of more than 20, uh, 20 other books, including Lessons in Hope, My Unexpected Life with St. John Paul II. He is a senior Vatican analyst for NBC News, and his weekly column, The Catholic Difference, is syndicated to over 85 newspapers and magazines in seven countries. George Weigel is the recipient of 19 honorary doctorates in divinity, philosophy, law, and social science. George, welcome back to the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America. Thank you, Ahmed. It's always a pleasure to be with you and your colleagues at the Institute for Human Ecology, which is really one of the fine uh, new initiatives at, at America's Catholic University. Thank you. It's always great to, to have you here. Um, in your foreword, you discuss the educational pilgrimage of St. John Paul II and its impact on the world. Could you tell us what was distinctive about the education of the young future Pope? It was distinctive, Emmett, in that it's almost unimaginable today. Uh, Karol Wojtyla grew up in a provincial town, Vadovica, about uh, 40 kilometers, 40, 50 kilometers outside of Krakow. But while he, he grew up in a small town, Polish elementary and secondary education in those days actually puts ours to shame. Uh, it was a deeply humanistic education in which language skills, knowledge of history, knowledge of one's country's literature, Latin and Greek in secondary school were all assumed to be part of an educated person's curriculum vitae. So uh, Wojtyla emerges out of what we would call high school with an education probably superior 
to that of most college bachelor's degree recipients uh, today. He then goes to the ancient Jagiellonian University in, in Krakow, uh, hundreds of years old, but his undergraduate career uh, is immediately stifled, to put it gently, by the German invasion of 1939 and the German occupation, which continued for the next five and a half years. During that time, the Agalonian University reconstituted itself as an underground institution of higher learning, so that in a sense, he completed his college education in a, in a clandestine way while performing in a clandestine cultural resistance group, a theater group called the Rhapsodic Theater, uh, and working as a manual laborer. Uh, these two experiences, we'll just pause on those for a minute, uh, I think left him with important convictions. The first from the elementary and secondary school experience in Vadovice is that culture is the driver of history over the long run. Uh, he was never susceptible to the Jacobin temptation to think that politics is the driver of history or the Marxist temptation to think that economics is the driver of history. He knew from that early education that what counts over time uh, in a society is the depth of its culture and that culture's grasp on the uh, truth of things. Moreover, uh, I think he learned that culture has a regenerative capacity. Uh, Polish culture had kept the Polish nation alive when the Polish state disappeared from the map of Europe between 1795 and 1918. From the Agalonian experience, I think young Wojtyla uh, learned, uh, first of all, that freedom is never free. Uh, and secondly, uh, he learned a view of life. I mentioned that he had been involved in this underground theatrical group. And he certainly picked up some skills in that. Uh, as we know from his days as Pope, uh, he was a powerful public presence. He had a great sense of timing, a very sonorous voice but he didn't just get skills from his theatrical experience. He got a way of looking at life. And that is to understand every human life as a drama lived in the gap between the person I am today and the person I ought to be. That's an inherently dramatic situation. And that's the drama of the moral life that he would go on to describe as Pope in the encyclical uh, very ton of splendor. So those are some things that we get from his early educational experiences. Uh, how, uh, how did his education and, and education in, in Poland when, when he was growing up, uh, what, what kind of bearing do you think that had on the course of history and the course of his pontificate? Well, certainly that understanding that culture is regenerative and transformative, if it's a culture uh, anchored in the truth, uh, had an enormous impact on history. Because when, as Pope, he goes to Poland for the first time in June 1979 for that nine day pilgrimage that really uh, turned the course of 20th century history in a different direction, he didn't speak once in those nine days about politics or economics. He said in 50 some variations on the same great theme to these people he knew so well, you are not who they, the communists, say you are. Permit me to remind you who you are. You are people formed by a particular culture and history at the center of that culture and that history is your Catholic faith. In fact, Poland begins, what we know as Poland begins with the baptism of uh, Prince Mieszko the first in uh, 966 AD. And if he continued uh, 
to say in June 1979, if you reclaim that cultural truth about yourself, you will eventually find tools of resistance that communism cannot match. And that notion of living in the truth, uh, of course, was a dominant notion in the human rights resistance to communism throughout Central and Eastern Europe in the 1980s. And it gave birth to the solidarity movement 13 months after that first papal pilgrimage to Poland in June 1979. I think you can trace all of that back in some sense to this culturally enriched education that young Karol Wojtyla had in Wadowice as a boy and a teenager. And then that's fascinating. And then, so the, the solidarity movement then, would it have been then uh, this, this tremendous education you spoke of uh, obviously helped form uh, the future John Paul II. Uh, what kind of effect do you think it had on, on the workers? I mean, th this was a, a, just an incredible moment in history when uh, the solidarity movement, uh, but were, did they benefit from that education as well? Uh, I think the connection between the church and the solidarity movement was put very well to me when I first went to Poland shortly after the Berlin Wall came down to investigate really the question, what role did the Pope and the church have to do with these amazing events that we now call the revolution of 1989? And when I asked the people who had made the Solidarity Movement, uh, which was a very broad gauged movement of social renewal, it was a lot of Catholics to be sure, but there were non-believers, there were intellectuals, there were workers, there were some reformed Marxists, there were all sorts of people involved in, in Solidarity. No matter who I talked to uh, in that first visit of mine, research trip of mine to Poland. Uh, no matter whom I talked to, whenever I said, when did this all begin? They would say it began when John Paul II came here in June 1979 mm. and, and rallied the country. There's a second answer that's I think equally relevant to the concerns of this wonderful book, A Vision of Hope. Uh, I was talking to a, a solidarity chaplain, a, a priest who had been involved in, in providing spiritual uh, help, sacramental help, confessions, mass, etc., to uh, workers in the Gdansk shipyards where the solidarity revolution began. And this priest said to me, you know, those faces you saw, at the gates of the shipyard during that occupation strike that created the solidarity movement. Those young men were the kids that we catechized in frozen Polish church basements in the late 1950s and early 1960s. So their religious education, the workers' religious education, gave them a sense of their human dignity, uh, gave, them, gave them a sense of freedom, really in the deepest sense of, of human freedom, living in the truth about yourself, uh, that John Paul II could then ignite in June 1979. So it all connects. It's fascinating. It really is. Uh, what, what would you say are the, the lessons that, that America uh, can draw from this and, and the church in America, um, perhaps? I mean, we're, we're entering or we're well in, in the midst of our own sort of contentious times. Uh, we're entering a, a period of arbitrariness and, and maybe um, mob rule in, in some respects uh, uh, or, or corporate, <laughs> corporate rule in, in other respects. Uh, what, what lessons can we learn, do you think? There, I would turn to uh, Wojtyla's experience as a university professor. He 
And from 1954 until his election as Pope, uh, he taught philosophical ethics at the Catholic University of Lublin, which was the only Catholic institution of higher education between Berlin and Vladivostok, which is like 15 time zones. Uh, as one of his colleagues put, put it to me, the Catholic University of Lublin was the only place where philosophy was free between Berlin and Vladivostok between the middle of Europe and the edge, the eastern edge of Soviet Siberia. And in that unique situation, Wojtyla, who taught undergraduates as well as graduate students, learned two things that I think we may have forgotten in, in contemporary American education, or at least things that are not emphasized quite as much as perhaps they should be. The first is that young people want to be challenged to heroism. Every young person wants to live a life of consequence. We don't become cynical and embittered until if we do, until rather later in life. Young people want to be challenged to live heroic lives of consequence, but we're not going to do that. We're not gonna offer that challenge in our educational system if we have this dumbed down view of the human person as simply a bundle of desires. Uh, that seems to be the dominant anthropology, if you will, the dominant view of the human person throughout American culture today. Uh, and it's demeaning. Um, and it leads to uh, I think a dumbed down, dumbed down forms of education. I think the second thing that Wojtyla learned at Loveland, particularly when he was working on, you know, the ethics of human love, both as a philosopher and as a priest helping young couples prepare for marriage and, and family life, is that young people want to love with a pure love. We all want to live with an undivided heart. And that truth is also forgotten in a cultural circumstance in which, if it itches, scratch it, is, is the dominant message sent by the culture, by the advertising we are subjected to constantly, uh, and increasingly by the law. Uh, we're having this conversation at a time in which the Congress of the United States is considering something called in truly Orwellian terms, the Equality Act, which if passed and signed into law by President Biden, will criminalize the Christian and Catholic view of the human person, which is that God made humanity male and female, Genesis chapter one. According to the Equality Act, if a boy or girl, if a boy declares himself a girl, or a girl a boy, they are to be treated as such for purposes of American civil rights law, including in schools. This is the total reduction of the human person to desires, no matter what those desires are, or how disordered and pain inflicting they might be. So what John Paul II taught throughout his entire pontificate, namely that the idea of the human person really needs renovation uh, in world civilization today uh, is becoming more and more obviously true uh, every day. And the role of the church in all of this, of course, is to lift up Jesus Christ as, as John Paul II used to put it, the answer to the question that is every human life. In Christ, we see what God intended for humanity from the beginning, especially in the risen Christ, whom we will celebrate this coming Sunday.
George, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. This is just a, a fascinating, fascinating conversation. Uh, it, it, it is a conversation that is sorely needed, I, I believe, here in the United States um, for the very reasons you just stated. And, and the, the experience of, of John Paul II and, and indeed of, of Poland, um, I, I think as you uh, depict in, in your foreword to this wonderful book is, is a source of, of inspiration and hope for us, I think, moving forward. Uh, thank you very much. We, we really appreciate um, your, your work overall and, and your work on this book. And thank you for visiting with us today. On behalf of the Institute for Human Ecology, we'll, we'll continue with the other panelists. Um, George has to leave us, and we just want to wish you a joyful Easter. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, so next, we'll, we'll hear from Kara Candle. Uh, Kara has spent the last 10 years working on education policy. She is a senior fellow with both Pioneer Institute and a Center for Education Reform. She is also a founding team member of the National Academy of Advanced Teacher Education and a research assistant professor at Boston University in its Department of Educational Leadership and Development. Kara has authored or edited more than 25 papers and three books on education policy. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature from Indiana University a Master of Arts in Social Science from the University of Chicago, and a Doctor of Education from Boston University. Kara contributed several chapters to A Vision of Hope, and uh, we welcome her here uh, today. Kara, could you uh, tell us about your findings in the book? Absolutely, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you so much for hosting this webinar today on this really important topic. Um, as you noted, I have the pleasure of serving as a senior research fellow at Pioneer Institute. Um, and it is for Pioneer that I co-edited this book with Chris Sinicola. Um, the book is actually a compilation of papers that have been written really over the past almost 10 years. Um, and it was about a little over a year ago that we decided um, that there was enough there to sort of update some of the material and bring this conversation about Catholic schools very specifically in Massachusetts um, mm -hmm. to the fore. And, and I should say that the reason we chose to do that, part of the reason we chose to do that, sort of the why of the book, is that I think at Pioneer we felt a real urgency around um, highlighting what important national resources our Catholic schools are. Um, so as you noted in my bio, I, am, I come at this from the perspective of somebody who uh, studies schools, has trained teachers, I've spent, um, I did not attend a Catholic school interestingly, but I've spent a lot of time in Catholic schools sort of trying to understand um, what goes on. Um, others have written extensively about sort of the secret sauce of Catholic education. We can go back to, to James Coleman's work to to understand that Catholic schools have historically um, helped students of all backgrounds, a very diverse background, socioeconomically diverse backgrounds, um, diverse by race and ethnicity. Catholic schools in the United States have long helped all students achieve um, really excellent academic outcomes. And in fact, they do so when traditional public schools often cannot. Um, so we know that longstanding achievement gaps have existed in the public schools in this country. And what we were trying to do was sort of understand does this trend hold true for Massachusetts? And, and if it does, why? And we also wanted to understand a little bit more about um, what it is that makes Catholic schools in the Commonwealth special. Um, they're, you know, Catholic schools across the country are special, but in the Commonwealth, we have some particularly innovative Catholic school models. I should say, of course, that we undertook this at a time when Catholic schools across the country are closing. Um, they were closing before the pandemic for various reasons, and the pandemic was not kind to our Catholic schools, which, although they tend to charge very low tuition, certainly lower than average um, per pupil expenditures in public schools, certainly lower than the cost of most private schools, especially in a place like Massachusetts, where private school tuition can be very high. The Catholic schools have been shuttering in large part because they dedicate themselves to, as I said, serving all students. 
And what this has meant for the Catholic school model, so to speak, is that oftentimes Catholic schools are operating at a budget deficit. They are dependent upon philanthropy. So they might have something that we can think of as the real cost of a Catholic education, but very often families aren't paying that, especially in our nation's urban centers uh, where many excellent Catholic schools are located. Um, in about a year ago, just now, um, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was great fear among Catholic school researchers, Catholic school advocates, people who work in Catholic schools that indeed we would lose many of these schools simply because they were already operating on a bit of a financial precipice in many places. And also because families were going to suffer the economic com consequences of the pandemic, meaning in many places, um, families were not able to make final tuition payments, for example. We have unfortunately lost a lot of very high performing Catholic schools. In fact, well over hundred and mainly concentrated in our urban centers. These are the same schools that oftentimes serve as the only viable alternative to public school districts in this country. So in places that don't have charter schools or in places where there are limited charter school options, um, Catholic schools were the pre-charter school option, but they have remained an alternative to district schools for families that want a couple of different things, some of which have already been touched upon. Um, families of all backgrounds and faiths, um, and, and many times people not of the Catholic faith, choose, choose Catholic schools for the very high academic quality of education, for an education that is grounded in values, um, an education that really embraces um, a, a very content rich curriculum and an education in a school where they know their children can feel safe and cared for and part of a larger community. And that is along with um, some very specific expectations about the idea that all children can succeed academically. That is part of what makes Catholic schools so special. Um, so we write this book in large part to, to drive home the message that this is not this is a national resource that we should all be supporting and thinking about Catholics and non-Catholics alike, um, simply because it, is, it does so much for so many, our Catholic schools do so much for so many. Um, I'll talk just a little bit about what we find about Catholic schools in Massachusetts. And I can divide that into just a couple buckets. And I know that the wonderful um, Professor Patrick Wolf is going to talk in more detail about these things. But what we know about Catholic schools in Massachusetts is that the trends that we find for Catholic schools nationally mainly hold true. That is, they produce great academic outcomes for kids of all backgrounds. So when you compare Catholic schools in Massachusetts to uh, the kids who attend Catholic schools in Massachusetts to their counterparts of the same social background, socioeconomic background, um, who remain in the district setting in, in our public schools. And I should note that Massachusetts has some pretty darn great traditional public schools. Um, but when you compare uh, norm reference standardized test results, the Catholic schools certainly have an advantage here and certainly in core curriculum. We also know that Catholic schools in Massachusetts, like many Catholic schools across the country, help students graduate high school and attend college and especially see, see themselves through to college at higher rates than our, um, than our district schools and our traditional public schools. Now, we get into some of the theories around this, but I think that um, when you when one spends time in and observes Catholic schools that are performing really well, as I have had the privilege to do, um, something that always came to mind for me as sort of a qualitative researcher um, was that Catholic schools, I think, are able to achieve these outcomes in large part because of the things that I just mentioned, a content rich curriculum. Um, a really strong community, and this idea, this sense that we are all here to serve something greater, we are all in this together. Um, it's, an, it's an important part of sort of the, the knitting together of what makes a Catholic school and what makes a Catholic school community. So we know that outcomes um, are great and that those outcomes hold true for students across, uh, for very diverse groups of students across racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic spectrums. Um, we also know that Catholic schools, even in the face of great adversity, have remained, um, I don't know if I like this word so much, but I'm going to go with it right now, but they've remained innovative. And they've remained innovative sort of in terms of how they meet students where they are in terms of what students need. They've, they've done this in part, and I'll point to the Cristo Rey model, which many of folks listening today might know about. We have two wonderful Cristo Rey schools here in Massachusetts. Um, the Cristo Rey model was born in part out of a desire to serve 
only students who couldn't otherwise afford the cost of a private education, but also to, to make that um, a sustainable cost for folks. So the Crystal Ray model is a work study model. It focuses on um, providing students with jobs in the community, good jobs, I might add, while they're studying. And, and the, the pay that students receive from those jobs, these relationships that the schools have in the community, help students pay the cost of tuition, which of course the schools try and keep as low as they possibly can. So this is an innovative model in that it's serving two purposes for students. It's, it's about college and career and, and helping students sort of land in the world in a way um, after they graduate high school, they're far better prepared than many of their peers to navigate college, to navigate the workplace, but also offering them an academically rigorous content rich curriculum. So sort of marrying the best of both worlds. And we've also seen um, Catholic schools here in the Commonwealth embrace other forms of vocational technical education. Thinking about the medical sciences, we have many great um, vocational technical schools in Massachusetts, but now we can think about having schools that are offering a high quality academic curriculum with vocational technical um, complement to that high quality curriculum, as well as um, allowing students to prepare for, it's a different, it's a pathway to college and career. And finally, I'll say that sort of out of necessity, many Catholic schools have merged into what we call academies. So that is smaller schools coming together um, to create some sort of economy of scale. And we have an interesting chapter in the book where we talk about how in some cases, this has been a merging of two different or three different, in some cases, school cultures. But it is one strategy that has not only helped Catholic schools survive, but has helped those who want access to a Catholic education to continue to access it, especially, as I said, in our urban centers. I'll just take one more minute to talk about something that I hope um, our resident expert, uh, Patrick Wolf, will talk about. And also um, to note that uh, next, I believe, you're going to hear from Kendra Espinosa, who has a lot to say about how important it is to, for states in particular, to help families access not just Catholic schools, but whatever um, school of their choosing, uh, private school of their choosing, whether it's faith-based or not. Um, and that is that in too many places, although I will say this has been a wonderful year for what we refer to as private school choice. In fact, just in the past week, we have seen two states hop on board, West Virginia and Kentucky, in, in opening up options for parents who want to um, use state funds to access something other than a traditional public school education. Uh, we have Kedra Espinoza to thank in large part for, for putting her foot in the door and opening this path to, um, to all parents having the opportunity to find an education that best meets the needs of their child. Um, but also Patrick Wolf, who's been working on this for a very long time. I sit here in Massachusetts, having co-edited a book about Massachusetts Catholic schools, and um, we are one of only two states that I'm sure Kendra will talk about has what's called a very strong Blaine Amendment, making it very difficult for our state to conceive of how we might use state funds to enable parents to access the kind of education their child needs, whether or not that's in a, uh, a private school or private faith-based school. Um, in the book, we dedicate a couple chapters, one to modeling what a voucher program would look like here in Massachusetts and another to, to modeling what a tax credit scholarship program would look like here in Massachusetts. And um, these, both of these, I think the tax credit is probably where, where donors receive a tax credit in contribution uh, in exchange for a contribution to a scholarship granting organization um, can be a very successful mechanism in places um, like Montana or Kendra's and, and perhaps someday in a place like Massachusetts where um, we want to give more families access to the education that they need, um, but have a, have a hard time doing that given the state's constitution. Um, maybe in the coming years, we will see even the constitu constitutionality of our own Blaine Amendment challenged. Um, and that's, that's my hope. But the book dives into the many different ways that Massachusetts and in fact, other states could make a Catholic education um, accessible for more families which would be good for Catholic schools because it would mean that they uh, perhaps would no longer have to worry so much, exist on this financial precipice, afraid of closure because they want to welcome all comers but can't charge a very high tuition if that's the mission that they are committed to. Um, and we think we feel very powerfully at Pioneer Institute that the state should have a role in helping families to access exactly what they need. Um, 
so that's just a little bit about the book. I highly recommend it to anybody who's watching this webinar. It was certainly a learning experience for me to participate in the and in, in, in authoring some of the chapters and co-editing the book. But um, I will pass it back over to our moderator now, who has a couple of more excellent guests to introduce to the audience. Thank you, Kara. Uh, we really appreciate uh, all the work you did on the book and, and thank you for visiting with us here today. Uh, oh. Hey, Jean-Marie, am I, am I back on? Yes, you're on. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, Carol, once again, thank you very much. Um, uh, our next panelist is Kendra Espinoza. Uh, as, as you all heard, Kendra was the lead plaintiff in the landmark U.S. Supreme Court case, Espinoza v. Montana Department of Revenue. She is a working single mother of two daughters who attend Stillwater Christian School. They were recipients of Montana's education tax credit program that was at the center of the Supreme Court case. And I'll briefly just run through that. The Montana, Montana legislature created the scholarship program uh, at the heart of the dispute. It provides a dollar for dollar tax credit of up to $150 for individuals and, business, and businesses who donate to private scholarship organizations. The money is used to provide scholarships for children who attend private schools, the vast majority of which in Montana are religious. However, the Montana Department of Revenue barred families from using the scholarships at religious schools. It did so on the grounds that a provision in the state constitution banned state aid for churches and religious schools. The provision at issue known as the Blaine Amendment is one of many adopted around the country in the 19th century to restrict funding for Catholic schools and to funnel students to public schools. The Montana Supreme Court agreed with the Department of Revenue. Uh, however, on a five to four decision, the Supreme Court of the United States reversed the state court's rulings ruling and held that the application of the Montana Constitution's no way provision dis discriminated against religious schools in the families whose children attend or hope to attend them. And all of this in violation of the Constitution's free exercise clause. Kendra, welcome, uh, welcome. Uh, could you tell us about your experience and what led you to be a plaintiff in the lawsuit? honored to be invited here today and be a part of this event with you. Uh, it, it was almost six years ago now that I met with uh, an attorney from the Institute for Justice, Erica Smith, and they had asked me if I would be a, a lead plaintiff in the lawsuit against this Montana Department of Revenue regarding the use of scholarship funds from the tax credit program for children such as mine attending religious schools. Uh, last June, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed Montana's highest court and ruled that religious school options cannot be excluded for parents who use funds from scholarship programs to access private education for our children. Uh, now, now begins the hard work. Uh, what will Montana and the rest of the nation's states do to turn this opportunity into reality for our students? Well, I can tell you that Montana is actively working to expand our school choice program. Uh, we have a couple of bills already making their way through the legislative system. Um, for other states to ensure options for their students for coming generations, um, they must also follow suit, which will help raise the bar on education nationwide and potentially alter the future for millions of children. You see, education tax credit programs offer incentives to attract donations from private citizens to scholarship organizations, which then distribute the funds to families such as mine to help with the cost of tuition at private schools of our choice. And often, but not always, those schools are religious. When the Montana legislature passed their tax credit program in 2015, I was and still am a single mom and I was looking for a better education for my girls, one that challenged them to a greater extent academically, one that taught them the value and the importance of critical thinking and one that more closely aligned with the Christian values that I endeavor to teach at home. In the public school setting, my older daughter was ridiculed and my younger daughter really struggled academically, but both of them would later thrive at a private religious school where they've been now for almost a full six years. When Montana Supreme Court struck down the tax credit program, I was denied access 
um, to the scholarships that my daughters needed. And while I understood the implications of this for my small family, I also recognized how it would impact thousands of other families across Montana and ultimately across the United States. I was willing to work hard to give my daughters the best that I could, but my limited income would only take us so far. In order for my girls to go to private school, we needed additional assistance, which would come in the way of scholarship programs such as this. I can tell you with certainty that there are millions of other families such as mine across this great nation who desperately desire better options for their children, but without the aid of scholarships and financial assistance programs, they will not be able to make those dreams a reality. When our nation was founded, there was to be no state religion, but neither was there to be a prohibition on state or local government support for citizens exercising their religious convictions. The majority of the early state constitutions clearly envisioned public support for a wide range of religious, private, and secular school options. In the mid 1800s, with large numbers of immigrants coming to America in the aftermath of the Irish potato famine, bigotry against Catholics started to develop and Blaine amendments began to pop up across the US in an effort to block money from flowing to the Catholic schools to which many Irish immigrants sent their children. And since then, in recent years, numerous states have been using these Blaine amendments as a means to restrict school choice options, effectively discriminating against religious families and preventing parents from accessing better educational, educational options for their children. In 2018, the Montana Supreme Court based its ruling on our Blaine amend Amendment, which barred public support to religious institutions. And as Kara stated, there are 38 states who have Blaine Amendments on our constitutions. But our attorneys successfully argued that tax credit scholarship programs are entirely constitutional and they do not amount to the use of public funds for religious schools, as the money is granted to the parents who choose the school that best fits their child's needs, whether that school is religious or not. U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts wrote in his majority opinion for our case that, quote, a state need not subsidize private education but once a state decides to do so, it cannot disqualify some private schools solely because they are religious. Now the court's ruling doesn't end this battle. It simply begins a new stage in the fight for the right of all of us parents to choose the education that is most appropriate for our children. State leaders around the country should be taking advantage of this historic decision by enacting or expanding legislation that makes religious liberty and school choice a reality for millions more families. Montana is currently in the process of expanding our scholarship program with a provision to increase the maximum donor contribution from $150 to $200,000 to increase the scholarship values to 100% of state average per pupil expenditures and to provide options for future growth as the program reaches capacity. My older daughter and I recently testified at this legislative hearing in support of this House Bill 279 because we recognize that by bringing more money into the scholarship fund, more students will be given the opportunity to reach their full potential by being educated at a school that best suits their needs. Prior to the Supreme Court ruling in our case, nearly 300,000 largely disadvantaged students in 18 states benefited from education tax credit programs. And I can attest to the fact that more than 90% of parents with students in school choice programs say they are satisfied with these programs. What's interesting to me is that in America's choice-driven higher education system, which is world renowned, both the federal government and the individual states support students by way of scholarships and loans, whether they go to Notre Dame, Yeshiva University or a public college or university. But to this point, they have not offered that same degree of support for primary and high school level education, where I believe it's critical that a strong academic foundation is laid from an early age, inspiring young minds to develop a curiosity for learning. I believe it's time that such programs are enacted for private education at these lower levels. And our recent Supreme Court win presents the perfect opportunity to make that happen. New Hampshire, Rhode Island, multiple other states already have tax credit education programs. And a program such as this in Massachusetts would permit students to attend any number of private schools, including Catholic schools, which we know are similar in demographics to the public schools, but they have a reputation for outperforming them, spending far less money. Any legalities or challenges that need to be worked through in order to make this happen can be overcome and the critical time to make that happen is now. As parents are becoming more aware of what their children are learning and are pushing back against a failing public education system, 
We're seeing enrollments at public schools declining considerably with families choosing private school options instead. There is a strong public interest in, in raising up a generation of educated, confident citizenry and parents are willing to go to great lengths to ensure that their children are challenged and engaged in an academic arena as long as the opportunities are available. With the US Supreme Court's landmark ruling in our case, it now falls to the state legislators to bring that same level of excellence and opportunity to kindergarten through 12th grade education. As a mom of two teenagers who have excelled in a private school setting, I look forward to seeing robust school choice programs become a reality for millions of families across America for generations to come. Thank you, Em, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate today. I'll turn it back over to you. Kendra, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, our, our, our next, uh, our next guest is Patrick Wolf. Uh, Patrick is the Distinguished Professor of Education Policy and holds the 21st Century Endowed Chair in School Choice in the Department of Education Reform at the University of Arkansas's College of Education and Health Professionals. Patrick has led or assisted with most of the key evaluations of private school voucher programs over the past 15 years, including recent studies of programs in Washington, D.C. and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as well as a statewide program in Louisiana. A 1987 graduate of the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Dr. Wolf received his doctorate in political science from Harvard University in 1995. Patrick authored the conclusion to A Vision of Hope, a chapter titled Nurturing Faith and Illuminating Lives. Uh, Patrick, welcome, and uh, could you tell us about your conclusions and give us your thoughts on the book overall? Sure, Emmett. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I feel as the final presenter today and also as the author of the conclusion in A Vision of Hope, in both cases, I sort of felt like the pinch hitter who was called to the plate with the bases loaded, nobody out, and an opposing pitcher who likes to groove his fastball. My colleagues all set me up for easy success. In the book, uh, what you get from the outstanding forward and uh, chapters of my colleagues is a clear picture of the fact that Catholic schools have been a great resource for the state of Massachusetts and uh, American society writ large uh, for much of America's history. But that resource is facing existential threats. And the great threats to Catholic schools in Massachusetts and, and in the United States are financial and uh, regarding the identity of schools. So we so we we have we have a financial crisis with Catholic schools, we have an identity crisis with Catholic schools and the two are related. So first the resource that Catholic schools have been uh, in our society. Uh, my fellow scholars and I have conducted a plethora of careful empirical studies of the effect of private school choice programs, private schooling, and particularly Catholic schooling on a variety of student outcomes. And as Kara Candle mentioned in her presentation, uh, the results are overwhelmingly positive. Uh, Catholic schools uh, promote the academic achievement of students. They very strongly promote the academic attainment of students. That is how far students go in school, high school graduation, college enrollment, uh, college completion. And as I like to say, how far you go matters more than how much you know. Uh, there are many sociological studies that indicate that uh, degree attainment and the extent to which students stay connected with the educational project matter a lot more for the success of their lives than just their scores on a standardized test. So the fact that, that private schools in general and Catholic schools in particular are such powerful engines for educational attainment in America means that they are delivering the outcome that really matters for students and their families. 
Catholic schools also excel at forming the next generation of citizens on a variety of civic values, including political tolerance, volunteerism, political knowledge, and political involvement. Students who attend Catholic schools display stronger levels of civic values and civic engagement than similar students who attend public schools. So Catholic schooling is this tremendous resource for students, families, and communities, but it's facing existential threats. The uh, finance structure of Catholic schools is extremely challenged. Uh, when my mother attended Catholic school in the 1950s, over 90% of the faculty and staff of those schools were religious individuals. Uh, and they worked for subsistent wages as part of their vocation. That made Catholic schooling widely available out of pocket for a economically diverse set of families. That has all changed. Uh, now, uh, fewer than 10% of the faculty and staff of Catholic schools are, are clerical. And so the schools have to offer at least subsistence and ideally competitive wages for the talent that they want to bring to the schools. And that has increased the, the cost structure of Catholic schools, still not to the level uh, that we pay for schooling in, in traditional public schools. Catholic schools still tend to be to have tuitions below the per pupil spending in public schools, but, but those tuitions are higher and they are increasingly out of reach for middle class and low income families. In fact, if you look at the enrollment losses in Catholic schools, almost all of the enrollment losses over the last 30 years have been from lower middle class families. Enrollments for low income families have been steady, not as high as we'd like to see, but still steady. And enrollments for higher income families have been steady, but it's the lower middle class families who just can't make those tuition payments and have, have been left behind. So what is the solution for the financial challenge? It is private school choice programs. Um, and, and Kendra Espinoza uh, did our, our country a great service in her successful crusade to make sure that faith-based schools are included whenever uh, states, now we're up to 28 of them across the United States, provide public funding for families to choose a private school for their child to attend, including a religious school. So private school choice programs uh, definitely are a help for this financial situation. In fact, 10% of all private school enrollments in 2019 were supported by public school choice programs. 10% of all private school enrollments in the United States. Uh, and, and that for, for Catholic schools to continue and to thrive, that percentage is all in, in li all likelihood is gonna have to increase. Now those programs need to be designed with generous uh, income eligibility requirements. Uh, because again, it's the lower middle class, the working class families who are typically uh, dropping out of Catholic schools. Uh, and so if the private school choice programs are limited just to the poorest families, uh, then the Catholic schools are not going to be able to attract enough middle class families to sustain their schools. And those choices won't be available to anyone. What kind of choices should be available through Catholic schooling? Basically, uh, I recommend that schools be Catholic with a capital C, as George Weigel described, and Catholic with a small c, as Kara Candle described. So let me very briefly describe what I mean here. Catholic schools should not be afraid to embrace their Catholic identity. Their acceptance of all children as equal creations of God and their responsibility to nurture the whole child, their academic needs, their physical needs, their moral needs, and their spiritual needs. 
that is the Catholic school brand. It's very attractive to many families, Catholic families and many non-Catholic families. And, and we need to avoid a situation where Catholic schools and other faith-based schools feel that they have to hide their religious identities to, to appeal to a broader group of, of families. Uh, my friend Charlie Glenn, who was uh, Kara Candle's mentor at Boston University, famously describes this as the bland leading the bland. That if private schools abandon their distinctiveness, there's really no compelling reason for families to choose them instead of their neighborhood assigned public schools. And you're basically taking distinctive schooling models and distinctively distinctive school cultures off the table uh, regarding parental choice options. Now, they also need to be small c Catholic. They need to be accepting of all students, regardless of their ascriptive characteristics and ideally regardless of their ability to pay. And that's when private school choice programs can really help out. Um, so this combination of, of, of authentically Catholic schools that are welcoming of all students and are willing to embrace these innovative models of learning, vocationally focused, uh, college prep focused, or the comprehensive parochial school. There's space for all of these schooling models uh, in, in our society. Uh, they all contribute to the flourishing of children and all of those choices should be available to parents like Kendra Espinoza, uh, who are looking for a distinctive schooling experience for their children. Thank you. Well, Patrick, thank you very much. And, and your presentation, I think, dovetails nicely with a, a couple of the questions we've, we've gotten. Um, and I'm going to combine two of those questions uh, into one and, and give a, a little bit of a, a run up to those. Uh, the, the questions concern education content. Uh, in, in that regard, I'll, I note that Pioneer, Pioneer Institute has done tremendous work um, for over a decade on making the case that, that students um, should have available to them a strong liberal arts education. And, and Pioneer has made that case um, that, that that works, that the, the old um, Massachusetts standards that were discarded in favor of Common Core, those, those old previously used standards demonstrate that that works and, and that it, it works not just for, um, for sort of the, the prep school model, but that it, it works for vocational schools as well. Um, so then we, we had uh, George Weigel talk today about, about uh, the future John Paul II's tremendous education in, in Poland and, and how that formed uh, really really perhaps the, the greatest, most profound life of the, of the 20th century. Um, and, and, and George described that as a classical liberal arts education. Um, well, it, in, in America, we've, we've used to have a strong liberal arts education, but over the last hundred years or so, and and uh, especially over the last 20 years or so, maybe we've, we've really uh, shunned that. We've cast that aside in favor of, of sort of a, a servile, narrow, skills-based education. Um, and uh, um, I, I think that, that this is really, really significant. Uh, the, the two questions, um, I combine them, uh, asked uh, whether you could speak to initiatives in classic Catholic education, uh, pointing out that there's several successful models in Massachusetts. Uh, down here in, in the Washington area, we have a, a tremendous model in St. Jerome Academy in Hyattsville, Maryland. Um, and there's, there's other uh, instances of it around the country, I think uh, Our Lady of Lords in Denver. Um, but what about that? Could, could you speak to that model of education? Uh, and, and in addressing that, 
is that model of education, is that something that that is uh, should be made available to all students or is it is it something that's just uh, should be afforded to, to say 10% of students? I mean, that's an that's an excellent question. Catholic schools have been known for providing a content rich education. Uh, and and that's really the essence of inspiring and uplifting students to reach their academic and intellectual uh, potential is 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 content is is really important. Um, and and there should be a depth to it to prepare students to be critical thinkers, critical speakers, critical writers. The classical education model has emerged, as you as you alluded to, in response to the watering down of the curriculum in certainly in many uh, traditional public schools and also in some private schools. And it is one of the fastest growing private schooling models in the country is the, the classical education model, which is more of a liberal arts type approach. And just from personal experience, we haven't yet seen any uh, any you know, rigorous empirical evaluations of the classical education model and, and what effect it has on students. All of the signals are it's very successful, it's growing. Um, students, you know, don't drop out at high rates. They, they, they stay engaged in it, in, in the challenge. But uh, I'll give you one example. And that is even as Catholic schools across the country have been closing the last few years, as, as Kara mentioned, uh, some colleagues and I here in Northwest Arkansas actually had the audacity to open a new Catholic high school called Ozark Catholic Academy. Uh, we felt the Holy Spirit was moving us to make that option available to families in our growing uh, community of about 500,000 people here in Northwest Arkansas. And that Catholic high school is built on the classical model. Uh, and, and central to that classical model is the, the Humane Letters course. And Humane Letters is, is, a, is a beautiful course that, uh, that crosses all grades of high school from freshman year to senior year. And what it does is it combines literature and history in key contexts that have been central to the development of Western civilization. So the freshman class, Humane Letters class, is called Athens. It's all about the experience of ancient Greece and all the, the famous philosophers and the development of, of systematic versions of mathematics and science and physics. Uh, the sophomore class is Rome. Uh, and it's about the birth of the Catholic Church uh, and in the midst of the Roman Empire. The junior class is London. And it's about the tremendous literary tradition and historical tradition of Great Britain in the 15 and 1600s when it emerged as a world power and gave us Shakespeare and, and, and other uh, fantastic uh, thinkers and writers. And then the senior capstone year is Philadelphia. It's about the launch of the American experiment. Uh, so it's a civics class, it's a literature class, it's a, it's a political science class. It pulls together all of those themes in a single course that's driven by rich content and, and significant student critical thinking and engagement. So that's the classical Catholic school model. We are implementing it, living it here in Northwest Arkansas and the school is thriving. Our, our enrollment is way up. Uh, we're doing great. Uh, and, and it's kind of this idea of sort of, sort of going against the grain uh, that has made Catholic schools and other distinctive faith-based schools so successful throughout our history. Uh, and, and is, is that, uh... Is, is this model, you, you, do you think this model is, is good for all students, most students, a, a small number of students? I think it's good for all students, Emmett. We enroll uh, almost a third of our students 
are on need-based fellowships in Ozark Catholic Academy. They all are doing well. They can keep up with the material. Many of them get help from their peers. So there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning and instruction. You know, the, 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 the more able students in one discipline support the students who are struggling a bit. And we do offer interventions, targeted interventions and tutoring to help keep uh, some of the students, you know, up up to to grade level and and up to the level of the material, if they don't have quite as strong of a background. So so it really is. Um, it's not just uh, an, an elite curriculum. It's not just for the best and brightest. It's really it's really accessible to a great diversity of students, regardless of their background, and and can really engage them in something exciting. Uh, that keeps them interested in in developing their academic abilities. You know, I, I can't help but but observe that that one of the the values of of reading, the benefits of reading classic narrative literature, is that it it, it really is a study of the human condition. Um, reading reading great narrative literature. Um, helps us understand other people and understand um, other points of view. And, and that, of course, helps us to, to get along uh, with other people. In, in, in a word, it, it lends itself to um, social trust and tranquility. Uh, and and you have to think uh, now, We've we've had decades now of diminishing amounts of of the study of classic narrative literature in in our schools. I just can't help but wonder whether that has had uh, an effect, a negative effect, on the discord that we are experiencing in society. I'm I'm quite concerned, Emmett, about. Uh, cancel culture and the elimination of classic novels about um, challenging times uh, in, in our nation's history and, and sort of how individual lives can be challenged in different ways that, uh, that, that can uh, concern the reader, that can provoke these human emotions. Um, and therefore should be embraced and celebrated. It's part of the human condition. But in modern society, too often, if there's any element of a story that is going to make a student uncomfortable, that story is eliminated, uh, is banned from the curriculum. And, and, and it, gets, it gets back to that point, that Charlie Glenn point about the bland leading the bland. It's like, if there's, if there's no real meat, no, no engagement, no, no sort of human emotion and struggle, uh, virtue and vice, if those aren't part of the stories, kids get bored. And, and, and they don't see the point of reading. They don't see the point of learning. It doesn't resonate with their own human and personal experience. Sure, and, and, the, and then the reading, reading the, moral, the moral struggles, uh, I think helps, helps children understand um, the, very, the, the very moral issues that, that they face. And, and um, it helps helps them avoid making imprudent decisions. Um, we have a, a question in for for uh, Kendra. Kendra, uh, what what advice could you give, or would you give to other parents who are concerned about um, uh, about whether or not they can attain a, a religious education, a religious-based education for their children? So I think that um, parents really do need to get involved in, in any way that they can at, at a local or district level. And, and I believe that it truly is up to us parents to fight for what we know is best for our kids. And, and you know, as a squeaky wheel gets that grease, so our participation and active 
um, 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 act, active engagement in legislation and, and hearings and stuff will empower leaders to act on our behalf and give our children those opportunities that might not otherwise be available if, if we didn't speak up. And, and I think that as parents, we need to be teaching our kids to also be bold and, and standing up for our faith as well, too, and for our religious liberties and, and hold on to those rights because we're watching those rights being stripped away. And, and, and right now, that's all that we have to hang on to. But I think as conservatives for far too long, we've been growing complacent and, and not fighting to maintain what our founding fathers fought for. And so if we don't stand up for that and don't teach our children to stand up and be bold in the face of persecution, then we will lose those rights for sure. But we, we have a follow on question to that or a similar question. Uh, how did, when you got engaged in this fight, uh, how did it affect your children's perceptions of you? Did they look at you as a hero? You know, I, I don't, I don't know that my kids thought of me as a hero until, until really till the end of it all. And they started to see all the media attention and they look back and, and, you know, they can Google my name and it comes up with all this information and all these pictures. And it really wasn't until that point that they saw me as a hero. They were just kind of going through the motions with it all and grateful for the opportunity to be able to experience some of these things and, and, and learn how this, the, the legislative process works and learn how the justice system works and, 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 and taking a look at um, situations outside of our own and recognizing that there are so many other families out there that don't have opportunities and, and, and if we can make a difference then certainly we'll jump in and, and be a part of that. But I don't think they thought of me as a hero just as their mom. <laughs> They certainly are grateful for all that we have done, though, and gone through. Uh, so on that note, I, I can't help but but be impressed with uh, a parent who who makes a, a plug for uh, their child's excellent school. So I got a little uh, a little prompt here from from an anonymous attendee, but who says, why not mention St. Benedict's Classical Academy in Natick? It's a Massachusetts jewel. So uh, I have just done that. Um, and kudos for you for prompting me to do that. Um, and another one, can Patrick Wolf give us the reading list of the Humane Letters Program? Um, Patrick, is there some place that they can find that reading list? Uh, I can I can send it. Maybe we can add it to the chat after the uh, after the session is is over. So it it will be there on on the website. I don't recall it. You know, I don't teach the class. I'm on the board of governors of the school, uh, but I have reviewed the curriculum. It's a very it's a very rich uh, curriculum and and covers a lot of. A lot of the readings, you know, many of the readings in it, especially for the junior and senior year, are readings that I first engaged in college at a liberal arts college, the University of St. Thomas. So that reflects back on George Weigel's comment about, about Pope John Paul and his early formation, that, that um, a, a very dynamic and rich and effective education is going to be introducing young people to very challenging material at a relatively young age. And, and they will rise to that challenge if you give them the opportunity. Okay. Uh, so, all right, I just got a message that, that uh, Jean-Marie will get that list from you and send it to the person who was asking. Well, look, thank you everyone for, for being with us today. This is a, a fascinating uh, discussion. Just really wonderful, wonderful panelists. Um, and uh, Kendra, thank you for all you did on, on bringing this case to the Supreme Court and, and fighting for really the liberty of all of us. Patrick, thank you for the tremendous work you do. Um, and I'd like to, to really thank Pioneer Institute uh, for its wonderful work uh, that it does. Um, now we invite you to listen to this conversation and past IHE events on our YouTube channel. Please visit our website, ihe.catholic.edu to see descriptions of our upcoming events. And our next event in collaboration with Baylor in Washington is entitled 
Does Civility Still Matter? Uh, that's on April 9th with Cornell West, Teresa Behan, Andrew Sullivan, and David Corey. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, and happy Easter. <laughs>